I'm Tim Ventura from AmericanAntiGravity.com, and I'm speaking today with Dr. David Maker, a physicist working on an ungauged theory of relativity that explains the results of Ponklinoff, Ning Li, and other physicists working with gravity wave generation. This theory also predicts large-scale gravity waves can be produced with superconductors and other easily obtainable equipment. Well, to start right out, both Ponklinoff and Ning Li have been predicting powerful gravitational beams as a result of work with superconductors. I understand that you're planning a similar experiment, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts about the results that you're hoping to get, as well as comments on their work and uh, the kind of results that they've been claiming to, to get as well. I, I'm also uh, building a uh, superconducting uh, experiment, and I'm going to try both AC and uh, DC. The results uh, I'm predicting utilize this equation that ha has a, an impulse that's uh, proportional to the voltage, to the angular velocity of the charge, and to the rate of change of uh, the uh, theta motion on the charge, and is inversely proportional to 1 minus the voltage divided by 512,000 volts. So what I would predict is that uh, this impulse is going to be large at a high angular velocity for the charge. It's going to be higher at a higher voltage. And uh, it'll be higher at a uh, fluttering of the position in the theta direction. And most importantly, that if V is the same as 512,000 volts, this is a singularity. So you'll have a very large effect above 512,000 volts. Now, Ning Li apparently did the experiment with AC. So this equation I have is an integral, so you're going to find that uh, the uh, you will only be able to get a back and forth sinusoidal motion uh, down, down range with AC. You might heat up and be able to measure a power output. With DC, on the other hand, there's a way to phase that equation that will give you an anti-gravity effect above 512,000. Enough? Yeah, well, you know, speaking of the theory itself, I mean, it is predicting large-scale results. What, what, uh, what is an ungauged general relativity theory? And, uh, you know, what, why is there a need for what you've described as a harmonic coordinate gauge in it? There are, in general relativity, there are 10 equations and 10 unknowns. The 10 unknowns is a 10 metric, uh, metric coefficient. Now, because of the uh, Bianchi identities, there really are only six functionally independent equations in general relativity. <clears throat> but in simple algebra, we know <clears throat> you need the same number of equations as you have uh, unknowns. So we need four extra unknowns here. What, what happens is, four extra equations, what happens is that uh, people introduce equations uh, for example, their the harmonic uh, uh, harmonic gauge equations are introduced that describe the motion of a particle in a harmonic oscillation. These four equations can be added. So, so it's a gauge gauge theory in the sense that you need these extra equations that uh, are in a sense arbitrary. You can put a lot of different types of equations in there. Ungauged means this that. This, these harmonic oscillation equations that actually give you the correct general relativity, including the, uh, one, the, the experimental results, these harmonic coordinate equations actually are real coordinate equations. They're not just gauged because if you look deeply into uh, what everything is made of around us, uh, every piece of mass around us is made of a direct particle in some way. You know, people say the quarks are direct particles, the electrons are direct particles, spin one half, they obey the Dirac equation. And the Dirac equation has, has as a solution a harmonic oscillation. So everything around us on a very deep level has a harmonic oscillation. Therefore, it can be those gauge equations, those equations that give you harmonic oscillation can be put in at, as an adjunct, as an augmentation of the general relativity, and you will then have n equations, and of course, 10 unknowns. You no longer have a gauge anymore. You're not free to 
to plug in an extra set of equations anymore except the ones that are harmonic. So you augment the Einstein equations with the Dirac equation, and you get this ungauged general relativity. So that completely eliminates the need then for the the uh, the Dirac equation uh, zitter bebegung oscillation just by putting the harmonic oscillation equations in instead. No, it completely eliminates the need uh, for for a gauge theory. The uh, the zitter bebegung still exists. These electrons still uh, engage in this motion, but now you've uh, combined the uh, Dirac equation with the uh, Einstein equations, and you've essentially unified quantum mechanics and general relativity. Um, so there's still a bit of wrong, but the point here is that it's physical, so that the uh, general relativity is no longer a gauge theory anymore. So this really becomes kind of the unifield, unified field theory that Einstein had had told a number of people that he wanted to achieve so badly, but, but many people felt like he never quite came through with. I, Einstein, uh, for sure, also wanted a, this problem to go away with the gauges. He, he realized that his theory was incomplete because he needed gauges. So uh, he, this solves the problem that was a big deal to him. He, I read some letters uh, between him and his wife in physics today a couple of years ago where he lamented the fact that his theory didn't, the general relativity didn't, uh, uh, didn't provide those four extra equations. You had to put them in artificially. And so it does satisfy that. Uh, it does also provide a, a, a unified field theory, but I'd have to go a little deeper into it to tell you how that works. Oh, interesting. Now, to interject for just a sec, um, I've actually been talking to a few people recently who have suggested that Gabriel Kron had also taken Einstein's incomplete unified field theory and done some work with it. And so it would appear that Einstein was very close, and, and maybe, um, you know, maybe the, the work that you've been able to do in ungaging that uh, can really kind of, you know, provide the bridge, I guess, to the complete theory. Uh, yes, the... Um what happens is that the, when you augment the Einstein equations with the Dirac equation, the best way to do it is to do a Fourier expansion of each gij and then replace the k, you know, e to the i k x replace the k with the k slash, which is called the Feynman slash. The easiest way to do it. When you do that, and you also apply, and I hate to put, give you all this technical stuff, but you also have to use the, the bilinear form, uh, bilinear forms associated with the Dirac equation that allow you to you know, calculate uh, current densities and things like that. When you do that, you get, a max, you get in the weak field the Maxwell's equations. With the Maxwell's equations, uh, you can then put on the right-hand side of the Einstein equations an E and M source, electricity magnetism source, the E squared over MC squared, for example, for the, uh, the zero, zero term. So you no longer have a, a, a mass source right there, but a E squared over MC squared source. When you do that, then you have Maxwell's equations with E and M. The problem is, well, there's an extra part. The, 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 it isn't exactly a Coulomb solution anymore, you know, of a po simple Poisson equation, which, which is part of the Maxwell's equation, well, there's wouldn't, an added part. Wouldn't that extra part create errant spectroscopy consequences then? Yes, that, that is a natural conclusion to draw, that it would pr create problems with spectroscopy, incorrect, incorrect results, because spectroscopy has uh, been, you know, uh, it's a very, uh, science has been around for a long time, and, but what happens is that, um, when you put that added part of, of the potential, it's added beyond the coulomb potential in the ex to find the expectation values of the hydrogen in the 200 space, you get an added tiny little shift in the energy. And that shift corresponds to the lamp shift. Now, you can do something similar here to get the gyromagnetic ratio. So you have this lamp shift. And that means you don't need all those higher order diagrams anymore, the ones that have 
more that are above the tree level, the ones that take up about two-thirds of uh, QED books. And these are also the ones that Dirac did not like. Dirac didn't like his equation being, being uh, prostituted like this with these higher-order diagrams. So you get rid of all that just by doing an ungauged uh, general theory of relativity, and you also simultaneously complete general relativity. So now the S matrix, it's a, it's a technical term for a scattering matrix. You can immediately construct a scattering matrix with one vertex S matrix. In the scattering matrix, there comes about these resonances, and there are two. And these two resonances correspond to the mass of the W and Z here, which means that you can get the weak interaction out of this. Now, if you put two of these objects uh, close together, see, now since we're dealing with a source here that is an E and M source, that means the horizons aren't these big K, you know, K equals G rho, 8 pi uh, over C squared horizons anymore. They're microscopic. They're on the order of the size of a, of a uh, proton. What happens then is that you uh, can get a stability. When you move something to a horizon, the clocks appear to slow down. And so the, um, the, the object then becomes a stable solution. That, in this case, that explains the proton stability. And when you allow the object to move around this horizon a little bit, you've solved this Dirac equation that we have. It's a generally covariant Dirac equation. And you can get the eigenvalues, mass eigenvalues, and others for hyperons. So you can do uh, just a simple thing of ungaging general relativity. It allows you to do hyperon physics. It allows you to get rid of the higher order Feynman diagrams, which Dirac really wanted to do. And it allows you to complete general relativity. It just pulls everything together in a very wonderful way. Well, in this new E and M source, the Einstein equations, then how does gravity really fit in? Gravity fits in <clears throat> because we have these. We still have the Einstein equations, the form of the Einstein equations. We still have them as a you know, dyadic equation. And um, what you can do is you do you have a single source here. It's a, it's a e squared over mc squared source itself with a z zero zero term for the zero zero term. Now, you, what you do is you do a coordinate transformation, this radial, of this source. You, you, uh, so this coordinate transformation is associated with the fact that the metric all around us is expanding. It's been known since the 20s that the, uh, the background ambient metric expands. It's, you know, the red shift is supposedly due to that, and the expansion of the universe is associated with that. So what you do is you do a coordinate transformation, it's a radial transformation of, uh, of this object. You pick the center of gravity on it at, a, at a certain radial distance, and you do that transformation. And what happens is that Z0 source, the Z00 source, splits up. The old E&M source here splits up into the old one plus a new one. The new one is very small because this coordinate transformation involves, you know, Hubble constants, very, very, very slight changes in distance here over you know, long periods of time, very, very small effect. But the Z00 then is very small, and it turns out, the Z00 turns out to be the gravitational source. So, and, it, and it's gravitational, it's a gravitational source easily, because you still are dealing with the Einstein equations. They still are here. So um, you get gravity by doing this coordinate transformation. Now the analogy is, the analogy is if you have a, a point charge with a coulomb E field around it, and you do a coordinate transformation of that charge to a moving system, you find that the E field now has, there still is the old E field, but now you have a new field around it that's old. This has been alone for many years. You have a B field. This is the way you produce B fields. You move a charge. So you do this coordinate transformation to the co coordinate, co-moving with this, with this this charge. You get a new field. It's the same kind of thing here as an analogy. You have a, a moving, moving, uh, radial moving charge, and you get a new field in addition to the old one, and that new field is the gravity field, and you still have the Einstein equations, so lo and behold, you have just derived classical general relativity. Well, since you're using an EM source, is there an artificial way to cancel the effects of that gravitational source? 
yes. If you look inside the coordinate transformation, it's a, it's a, this is a dyadic we're dealing with. So there's two derivatives multiplying each other, and uh, the, the zero is involved. So you have a time derivative. Um, it's t, it's d zero zero. So there's a time derivative in this, and um, there's a dt. Now uh, dt is in, in the derivative. Now what you need need to do is to calculate another dt that cancels the old one. So you have dt over dt t, t zero. Uh, it's a cool moving uh, it's a, uh, uh, dt. You you do the coordinate. You find out what that dt is. Now. You can pick some metric, you know, you, you could pick short tail or something like that. You know, pick and choose and see which metric works. What works is the um, care metric. Now, this is, not, this is the care metric with an E and M source in it. The G rho over C squared, A times A pi, has been replaced now, by, again, this is, again, by the E squared over MC squared, the new, the new E and M source, like we talked about initially. When you put that in there, into the care metric, okay, what you do is the care metric is, has quadratic terms. There's a ds squared, dt squared, and there's cross terms in the care metric, a dt and a d times a dr, let's say, or dt times d theta or d phi. That means it's kind of really neat here. You can solve for dt as a quadratic formula. And so you put in, the, you know, the in the care metric, there, there's going to be an omega, angular velocity. There's going to be a, in this case, because we're dealing with ENM, there's going to be a voltage instead of a gravitational potential. There's going to be an electric voltage, et cetera. And you put that in there, you solve for dt, and you're going to get this new dt that cancels. It can be negative, cancels the one that gave you gravity. And so you cancel out. There's no longer a z0, zero, zero source, a new, a new gravity source there anymore. Now, what's involved in this? dt that you just derived. There's an omega, an angular velocity. There's a voltage. And it turns out it uh, is a d theta dt, which is a fluttering effect. And it's divided by a 1 minus, in this case, because you're dealing with electrons, it's 512,000 volts. Okay, so, so the v divided by 512,000 volts in there. So you get this formula uh, by trying to cancel out that dt that gave you the gravity you no longer get the gravity, the gravity is canceled, and you you do that by uh, solving for the, this negative dt, and in that way you get that new formula that's in the state paper I, uh, I uh, presented, and you're able to cancel gravity. Ah, well, to interject again for just a second, I, I think it's really important because people can reference that paper to look at the formula, and they can then come back and, and hopefully interact with you a little bit more if they don't understand all of it. But the resulting formula is in the abstract of your STAFE 2003 paper, and it's claiming right. essentially that you need a high voltage, a rapid rotation, and for a huge effect, you need a voltage around 512 kilovolts, which right. is very similar to what Ning Li and Ponklanoff have been working with. Yes, Podlikov produced in the second experiment, the pulse one, I'm not going to comment on the gravity shielding experiment at all, right? but um, in the pulse one, which I think is very credible, he uh, produced, he had, a, uh, had a, a superconducting disk, a rather large one, and there was a coil around it that produced a magnetic field. We know that when you create a magnetic field in a superconductor, because of the Meissner effect, electrons are given a, 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 a high speed. And so the higher the B field, the higher the velocity, the higher the angular velocity of these electrons. So this thing is dependent on the angular velocity, just like that formula said. Now, so we, we pulse up the, the, the voltage. We don't see anything below 512. Suddenly, you have the stability here at 512. And there's a reason for that, because in that metric, you had a 1 minus a pi e squared over mc squared uh, r, you had a, a stability there that, that was times the, D, the dt term. DT. So this thing has more stability at around 512. So you have a stable electron cloud, and it's rotating, and it's coming off, it's coming off this uh, superconductor. And lo and behold, he found that he uh, started seeing stuff at 500,000 volts. Now, if there's slop, if there's a 10 kV slop, you know, it's hard to measure voltages around 500,000 volts. 
this is if there's a 10 kV slot due to measurement or due to you know the surface irregularities or something, that would explain he start, him starting out at 500 instead of 512. So it goes up, uh, keeps increasing the voltage, and uh, then this elect stable electron cloud is created and moves from this cathode, which is the superconductor, to the anode. And now what he had. It, it, what he had down range were some uh, pendulums. So these pendulums were free to move. So he, he, he recorded the height the pendulum moved as as the uh, this pulse went by. And it, remember, this equation I predict is an impulse divided by M equation. It's an impulse equation. Sure. So sure. he he measured the height of the pendulum, inferred. Um, yeah. In, yeah he, he measured the height of the pendulum, and then uh, that, that was his data. Well, uh, I uh, did something uh, similar with this equation. I calculated what the VE would be for the, the pendulum, what, what, what initial velocity it would come, it would uh, start out at, and he measured. He, he could go back, backwards and find the initial velocity of the pendulum from the height. It's, you know, it set mgh equal to one half mv squared. He could find the height. From the height, he could find the V. Well, I calculate the V, and I can go through and calculate his height. And so um, he, uh, so I, I did the theory. I used every piece of data I could from his paper. I uh, hit the pulse time. I the uh, which about a, I forgot a tenth thousandth of a second. I forgot what it was. Uh, the uh, the voltage, even the size of the superconductor. I used every piece of data I could get out of that paper, and I, the only inputs in, as a parameter, a free parameter, are simply the the, um, the final shape of the final shape of the disk. It starts out as a disk that's flat, and I didn't have to go very far away from a flat disk. One was nine degrees for the one material they used, and one was thirteen degrees, and the curves I get for. Um, these these pendulum heights versus the voltage they fit right on top of his right on top of his data as close as anything I've ever seen in data and so um, uh, that really does work uh, if this experiment was done the way he said it was explains virtually everything I know of about the experiment yeah it's it's definitely incredible because you've arrived in theory at a lot of the same experimental results that he and others have have claimed to have had happen in the lab, I guess. Well, you know, with these devices now, one of the things I wanted to ask is, you know, the big concern is transportation and, uh, you know, gridlock, traffic, and the rest of it. Do you think that these devices can be made as small as a car or maybe even just, you know, mass-produced, stamped out left and right so that consumers can buy them in the near future? Well, uh, they, I believe that this, uh, all you... What you need to do is be able to phase that equation correctly, and that's that's kind of tough. But and also to be able to bring the voltage close to 512 and a little bit above it. And when you do that, you get this really huge effect. But it's constrained by the conservation of energy. So instead of the thing being a an huge anti-gravity effect where it just shoots up, you you cannot put any more energy, get more any more energy out of it than you put into it. What constrains it then is the conservation of energy. You, you can put a little bit of power into it, and it'll float. And uh, a little more power into it, and it'll rise. And uh, I don't see any constraint. I need to, need to make a large device to do that. So, uh, and, and so I don't think I think it's possible that I don't know about the near future, but maybe in the far future. Uh, you might be able to uh, produce these on, on a mass-produced scale. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, and you may be surprised also, there are a lot of energy technologies that are moving forward really rapidly, you know, and even something like a conventional gasoline engine can put out a lot of energy, you know, if it's if it's driven correctly into an electrical generator. So we may see these things in the near future. And uh, especially in light of your theory, this ungauged general relativity, which is starting to be whispered about, you know, it's it's uh, one of those things that that's in some ways seems to come out of nowhere, and yet it applies in so many different areas of physics, and it explains things so much more simplistically than some of the QED models you'd, you'd mentioned earlier. Or the QED 
QCD as well. You yeah. really don't even need QCD when you solve that Dirac equation, this generally covariant Dirac equation. You you really you really just can get the mass eigenvalues and uh, that kind of thing, and you don't need uh, gauges. Uh, you don't need QCD. To, uh, Yang Mills theory, Yang Mills fields. You don't need any of this anymore. Well, one of the things I wanted to ask. I don't know if you'd be willing to give out your email address, or I, I guess you know, in worst case scenario, people could go to the website AmericanAntigravity.com and take a look at your papers. And I don't know if you have another website that you publish on, but if so, um, you know, any way that people could get in contact with you to learn a little bit more about this and just interact with you about these ideas would be great. Um. Well. Uh... I have a a uh, website, a maker, just maker three at bellsouth.net. Uh, I, I I want to point out I've been uh, working on I I really developed this and published a paper uh, related to it in 1999 uh, in chaos fractals, uh, chaos uh, solitons and fractals. So I have published on the ungaged part of this uh, in ninety in ninety nine uh, in January, and they can go to that paper, but uh, my uh, email is uh, maker3 at uh, bellsouth.net. Oh, okay. So maker3 at bellsouth.net is your email. And again, okay. there are documents online at americanantigravity.com. And for people who go to the STAFE website fairly often, I believe there are probably still some documents there from your 2003 publication. Also, I, I gave a presentation at the International Astronautics Con uh, Congress up in Vancouver and... Uh, I believe my presentations on that is on the uh, on the literature that came out of that conference as well. I've also given several state presentations and uh, uh, one in uh, 2003, one in 2002, and one in 2001 on the same subject. Wonderful. Uh, well, I sincerely appreciate your time. This has been a, a remarkable interview to learn more about this theory and how it applies to things we're already seeing and predicts even better things for the future. So thanks again for your time, David, and have a great day. Thank you very much.